the photographic work, Camera Obscura, Times Square in Hotel Room by Abelardo Morel, was acquired by the Hunter through contributions from the museum's 2021 Spectrum event and is now featured in the Hunter's latest exhibition, Beyond the Frame. Morel was born in Havana, Cuba and immigrated to the United States with his parents in 1962. He received his undergraduate degree from Bowdoin College and his MFA from the Yale University School of Art, as well as receiving honorary degrees from Bowdoin College and Lesley University. He was also professor of photographer at Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston from 1983 to 2010. His publications include a photographic illustration of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Dutton Children's Books, a camera in a room by Smithsonian Press, The Universe Next Door, published by the Art Institute of Chicago, Tent Camera, published by Nasrelli Press in 2018, and Flowers for Lisa, published by Abrams Books, also in 2018, just to name a few. Morel has also received numerous awards and grants, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, Infinity Award in Art from ICP, and a Lucy Award recognizing achievements in photography. Morel is a remarkable artist who reimagines our surroundings by effectively merging interior and exterior spaces and then photographing the results and making us aware of these surroundings ourselves. Tonight, he joins us to discuss how he developed his practice over time. Abe, I wanna welcome you. And um, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can um, tune in and share yours. Thank you, um, both Adira and Natalie. Uh, a pleasure to be invited. It's always nice to be invited to talk about one's work because, you know, in some ways I'm the expert on Abe. So it's not like a quiz that I'm going to fail. Um, but it, it does help um, uh, me and artists in general to be invited to make some sense of one's work. It, it forces us to be a little bit more clear about the trajectory of how things have gone and uh, what leads to other things. Um, so it's it's an exercise in precision and clarity and uh, and showing off. So so uh, I. I named the, the, the talk my optics because in a sense, that's how a lot of my contemporary work began um, in 1991. But in, in the late eighties, I was preoccupied with optical things, my optics, my glasses, things of that nature, um, how these rudimentary things um, affected the way the landscape, the the interior of a house was seen, a, a glass of wine, it can become a crude lens of a kind. I was fascinated by the interventions uh, through optics into how we see, uh, including, this is not a very good picture, but it was an experiment to see how a lens could capture my hand being seen on, by a door. So it was uh, a lot of fun to, to be a kind of a pseudo physicist and experiment with light, uh, including how my camera would see me. Uh, these optical games were really interesting. Uh, and in, 19, in 1991, I, I, I was teaching at the time, at, uh, I'd begun to teach at Mass Hard in 1980, 1983. But in the early 90s, I wanted to make pictures to show my students that had some component of what early photography may have been. So I concentrated on um, ideas to photograph about early optics, early cameras. And in this case is a very crude camera. It's, it's a box, in fact, with a lens where uh, a light bulb enters the interior of the the darkened interior. And this is, this is what photography is. If you had to 
show one picture, this is it. Um, and you know, you can have sophisticated stuff and shutters and funny lenses and all that. But essentially, to me, this is the crux of the photographic process. And when I made this picture, I thought, mm, you know, this is an interesting thing that I wanted to show my students, but it, in itself, it has a kind of a, a merit uh, about, you know, a subject matter that is photography itself. So I began to think about ways to use photography uh, and its, its uh, processes as a subject, uh, including uh, camera obscura, which is, is a, a process, a, a phenomena that's been known forever, uh, Renaissance and before, where a dark space with a small opening allows, for instance, in this case, the sun actually enters a darkened room and it gets projected on the other side. This has been known forever. Uh, in fact, it came with the world. There wasn't a Mr. Johns who said, okay, let's invent this. It, it was discovered. So um, in, I was also doing a lot of research on people talking about uh, camera obscura and it, it goes back to, you know, 384 BC, Aristotle talking, talking about doing a solar eclipse, if one sees it through a kind of a uh, devices that have small openings, you see uh, the sun in many, many, many repetitions. Um, this is something we see in plein air. Uh, if trees are and leaves are gathered together to allow small spaces to let light sunlight through what you get because of the smallness of the openings you get reproductions of the sun this is what uh we we've always seen but in fact this is a kind of a camera obscura uh and this is doing a solar eclipse on the ground where again the the entering of the uh the eclipse through small openings allows the image of the eclipses to be on the, on the ground. So these are thousands of eclipses. Aristotle talks about this. It's been with us forever. Um, this is a, a Van Gogh uh, painting in uh, the south of France that has the same ideas here. It's light coming through small openings, allowing little little concentrations of suns. Uh, and I'll end up with Van Gogh because it's uh, a, a new project of mine. This is the first camera obscura picture I made in 1991. And in fact, what's interesting is that they had no one had made a picture of a room receiving an image. I mean, boxes and small opening, you know, small, Cameras were used, pinhole cameras, but I turned this room into a camera obscura by darkening it, all the windows, uh, use film, and the exposure at that time with film was about eight hours, but uh, it, something came out. So I'll show you some later ones, it's early in the early, that was 1991, 94, This is a very large apartment in New York City. And the plastic you see is what I use to cover uh, uh, the windows so that darkness could happen. A small opening made produce this picture. Again, this is not high tech. This is a dark room and a small hole. Um, low exposure. Many, 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 many years later, I got an invitation from this man who owns the Palazzo in Venice in front of the Salute. And he said, you know, I've seen your work in London. I would like to uh, invite you to Venice and your family to stay with us. And so you can do some work in Venice, uh, maybe in my mother's room facing this. And I said, of course, yeah, of course, you know. Um, so we went. And by that point, I was using color, color film. So 
the mother's room let that in. Things have advanced, to, at this point, things had advanced to the point where I'm using, instead of an opening, a special lens that will focus on certain distances, so it's really sharp. Uh, also brighter, so that the exposures were not eight hours, they were more like six hours. But uh, throughout my, my work, I've advanced the technology behind it. This is uh, the, the man who owned the Palazzo said, it was looking at a kind of leather painting and said, you know, I know the guy <laughs> looking at a kind of leather painting who works there, right there. And he's got a nice view of this. And this is a, a kind of leather painting. Uh, so I made a picture myself uh, of it. And this is a six hour exposure. I was able to also turn the image right side up. I'm, I'm a nut for advancing technology. So I figure out a way to do that. This is still film. I, I use only uh, digital technology now. So things have changed quite, quite radically. But this was really a, like a wonderful canaletto, invented canaletto in a room. This is in Venice as well. In uh, a woman who owned a palazzo, but she was from Colombia, the country. Her whole house was um, this, um, decorated with Colombian jungles on the wall. The, the strangest surrealism I've ever seen in my life. So this is by assistant C, CJ setting up a picture with my camera and this is uh, what resulted. So a Colombian jungle receiving the Grand Canal uh, and you could, not, you, you, you could not invent this more complexly than the reality of it. This is much, much later in, um, in the Tuscany, in the, the, the Duomo in Florence. Uh, and it's a, a digital camera at this point too. So the exposure is about three minutes, um, much faster. Uh, but I love the, the density of what's inside the building, what's inside the office paintings and such things like that. And then the outside becoming one beautiful collage of a kind. So this, these are fairly recent, 2017. Uh, I wanted to make pictures uh, such as my camera obscure pictures outdoors. And since I needed a room before, I decided to uh, kind of design a tent that would allow me to do that. This is an early uh, design or illustration of people. This is before photography was invented, but there were ways to put optics on top of a tent so that, with a prism so that the image of the landscape would fall onto this guy's uh, notebook. So he could draft it. I mean, this existed before photography. Uh, I designed a kind of a crude tent, but the idea was, so like, like this guy, to put a periscope-like thing uh, sticking out of the tent, uh, which looks onto a landscape, which gets projected on the ground, which is then photographed by a camera inside the tent. It was a pain in the ass because it was a lot of weight and a lot of uh, weirdness, but here are some pictures, and this is what it looked like. And it was a lot of uh, tr trouble. People would not uh, sometimes let us in places, and, but this is an early version of my, my tent camera. Uh, I grew up in Cuba, as Natalie said, and I saw a lot of John Wayne movies, a lot of Westerns, and so my conception of um, my concept of the US was mostly cowboys and that sense of the, the West. Um, so I decided to uh, propose to National Geographic that I would do national parks in that style. And uh, Westerns like Rio Bravo, uh, which I had in my memory. 
can I do pictures in the American West? So these are some images that I made with my tent in the landscape of the West. And again, it's, it's just this wonderful thing where the ground itself with its variations uh, receives an image through the prism onto the ground itself. So if you're inside the tent, you see this plainly. It's not Photoshop, it's what it, show, what it shows for real. So many of these pictures were of places where Ansel Adams photographed. So that's the image of the tent and the result. This is in Acadia uh, National Park in, Ma in Maine. We put the tent on dead grass, looking at this early spring scene. And, and this is what, what the camera saw. And I loved it because uh, in some ways I've always been enamored and jealous of painters. You know, maybe uh, I could become a painter. In, in some fashion. This is also from the uh, Old Faithful in, in uh, Yellowstone. This is what perhaps the, the first picture ever made uh, of it by William Henry Jackson. Uh, in fact, it, it, he showed it to Congress and because of pictures like this, Congress was moved enough to turn it into a national park. So this is a very important picture of Old Faithful. Uh, anyway, I got permission to, to put my tent nearby. Um, some people ask me if I, uh, how come they let me camp out in there? And I said, no, that's not what's happening. Anyway, so I, because of digital technology, my exposures are now a minute to two minutes. So this is the picture that resulted from it. You can still see a kind of a row of people and the event itself, it, it's, it's transformed. This is not the sort of picture that you've seen before. And I, it was, it's my joy to try to figure out ways, new ways to make something that's very known into something different. Ezra Pound, the poet once said, make it strange. Make it new. Make it new, um, and that was sort of sort of my motto. Still, this is in the Yellowstone in the winter. I brought my tent camera to Giverny in France in Normandy because I wanted to to photograph where Monet uh, painted in, in the, these gardens. This is a Monet painting in the gardens. His painting. And uh, Mr. Monet in the garden. Anyway, they, I asked for permission and they said, yeah, sure, you can make pictures in the garden with your tent. Uh, so here is some, here is a, a gardener we're looking at Monet's house and part of the garden in it. So this is a short exposure. What's, what was really nice is that the, the ground was all oh, this pebbly uh, stone, which in, in a way it turned everything that fell on it, projections into impressionism in a natural way. This is a view of the gardens. I mean, it is a, it's a Monet, even though it's not what I intended. There's a wheelbarrow there and it's a gorgeous light falling on it. Late, uh, really early morning, sun rising. Interesting because, you know, they satisfy my desire to, to deal with paint, which you'll see at the end of the talk. I'm throwing in some new work that I've done um, recently. I've been playing with wood blocks 
hundreds and I have thousands of them now, making multiple exposures of arrangements. So this is three different exposures of three different setups that I combine together. So there's a certain kind of cubism inherent in this kind of work. And these are other, I mean, I've made a lot of them uh, playing in my, in my studio with blocks. It was, it's sort of silly, but it, it, if the nature of art is, a, is play, I was doing it right. And one picture led to another, and one picture showing a shadow made me think, well, maybe I can make um, things that feel like futuristic cities, you know? So a couple of flashlights on wood blocks throwing these incredible shadows against another piece of wood. It was fantastic to just kind of create uh, these film noir, almost film noir, sets from 1950s American movies, which I love. And this is uh, what the camera saw. It's not, I, I did not use tricks to, to make up stuff when I mean, this is sitting on a table after many hours putting it together and two flashlights lighting it so there's a kind of a bluish and warm color and i love the way that shadows become solid and solids become shadows um very futuristic kind of city and then one where it's a kind of a triptych uh, uh, kind of a, I don't know, it depends on how you think, but it, it could be frightening or wonderful. Um, I've been working on a few other things lately and one sparked by this idea of multiple exposures of three different setups. Uh, this one was uh, children's color blocks, primary colors, blue, yellow, and red. Um, and what I did was to play, to do one exposure of one setup where all the prime colors were there, then mix them up, shoot another picture, mix it up again and shoot another picture. So this combination of multiple objects with different colors, in combination you get secondary colors and wonderful uh, kaleidoscopes of it. Just wonderful. Some other things I've been doing are containers, things that hold uh, things in life, uh, but contained sort of like the womb in some ways, but small, small containers that hold big events. Don't ask me why I did it. And then um, still lies with glass constructions. Uh, this is a lot of glass pieces that I bought on eBay, but there are three different exposures. I moved them three times. So uh, what you get is this composite of an object in front of another, then later on another object in front of that. Uh, and you get this random, beautiful, translucent, melding, uh, glass. But I also wanted, this is window light, I also wanted a, a beautiful 17th century Dutch light on it too. So this combination of old fashioned light and then futuristic uh, looking stuff. Same thing with ceramic. I mean, it's, um, I mean, I, my, my studio is full of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of art books. It's mostly art books, 
from the beginning to Morandi to Picasso. I mean, I'm always kind of thinking about ways to put together. And then Morandi, the Italian painter who made gorgeous, gorgeous still lives, um, was sort of an inspiration for this. I'm going to show you, I, I did a whole book of, of flowers for my wife. I made 76 pictures. I'm not going to show you them all, but I wanted to show you some pictures of flowers that have led to some new consideration of paint. So this is, um, I would make paintings of a vase, put sunflowers in it, make double exposures with paint you know, to create a kind of a, a hybrid of painting material and organic stuff. So a lot of these flower pictures, um, a number of these flower pictures led to my thinking about doing pure paintings. This is a collage from uh, 17th century Dutch uh, still life paintings. And again, this is uh, my own sort of painting on the flowers themselves, and maybe, maybe making several exposures so you get a kind of a, a translucency of paint onto the organic flower itself. I wanted to sort of break the boundaries between these two media. Feels like a, a Gerhard Richter to me. This is a Van Gogh book of Van Gogh paintings, which I lit with flashlights and I also painted on top of it. So I was being a bad boy, messing things up. Uh, then in the last three, four months, I decided to actually make pictures of paint itself, where on a piece of glass or a piece of wood, I would spread paint myself. I would design it. I'm not a painter but I can move things around and then basically photograph what I made on that surface. But oftentimes when paint is still wet, so there's a kind of a transient feeling happening, uh, a, a real painting would never have the wetness of it. So I'm trying to give it a photographic feel, even though it feels like a painting. So these are some of these images. M multiple exposures. In this case, there are two images. I made one swirl, took a picture of it, made another swirl, put them together. By the way, it took about 80 of these to get, to get one. Multiple exposures where I in my own primitive way, I could make shapes that feel like flowers, organic stuff. <coughs> this is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, three, <clears throat> three different exposures of uh, pretty thick paint on a piece of glass. So uh, one, color replaces another one and replaces another one. So there's a kind of a, a sandwiching of thick paint creating a, um, a new kind of thing to it. It's just like a gorgeous impressionist painting. These are some recent ones where I'm actually trying to get more realism in terms of space and objects in them so that this is uh, uh you know made out of dowels that i painted individually to create a kind of a screen or a door so they're beginning some of these pictures were beginning to get a kind of a, a feeling of space and 
location. where two, two pieces of wood coming together become, to me, we felt operatic. And we're a really weird space, some corner of a room where there's a painting hanging. It's actually, it's a, it's a mirror uh, looking at another wall. Uh, I'm not sure you're supposed to know that or you could figure it out, but creating a kind of a strange psychology for space with paint in it. This is really recent where the, the surface itself, I'm lighting it from the side so you get a very dramatic raking light um, where the, the ground, the landscape itself of paint becomes interesting. And this is also a recent one where it's, uh, it could be a, a painter looking down onto a valley and seeing all the shapes, um, which I'm gonna end with uh, this announcement. I, I'm going to, to France in June and July to use my tent um, to make pictures in maybe in the spirit of Van Gogh. Uh, but it's, I, I'm redesigning the tent. So the tent's gonna be a lot smaller. We're gonna have someone sew a, a drapery around it. So that it's a, more possible to get into places. Um, but I'm going to uh, Arles, San Remy, Auvers, uh, to bring this tent to try to, do work in the spirit of Van Gogh. And if you think about it, this feels like a Van Gogh. Uh, I, I'm not comparing myself to Van Gogh, but it has the quality of some of the work he made in Arles and uh, San Remy of, you know, after um, wheat being sown or uh, picked, but it, 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 this is what I'm hoping I get in in France starting June. So I want to thank you for putting up with me, and uh, I, I hope that you have some questions uh, because I love that's my favorite part: questions from people like, "What the hell is that?" Thank you. Abe, thank you. Thank you so much for you know, sharing this overview kind of on the development of, of your career and, and this exciting new um, new series of works that we have to look forward to. Um, absolutely. Um, anyone who is tuning in right now as a kind reminder, you know, please feel free to ask any kind of questions you have for our artist um, in the Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, we will be feeding those to him. Um, the first one I would love to ask you is um, about your background. Are you like literally what is behind you? Are you in your um, studio space? Uh, yeah, I, uh, my, my wife and I, Lisa and I moved to this place in Newton, which is uh, near uh, Boston. And it was about nine years ago and it had a studio, which I've never had in my, in my life. It's interesting. I've always sort of wanted a space to work in, but this place had a studio. And, uh, and it, it's been amazing. I've been very productive, putting things up and leaving them overnight and working on it, uh, painting, uh, inventing stuff. I, I've, I'm like a kid again in some private room. So, uh, and I, again, I, I don't have a history of learning how to paint. Uh, but this bug has really hit me and I don't know, I have the space for it. And I don't have to uh, clean it up so that we can have guests either. It's mine. Well, it's certainly one of the advantages of um, things that have come out of recent events and the ability to have, you know, conversations like this in a virtual setting is, you know, we can walk into your space and we can see your your studio space. It gives us kind of a 
an inside um, to your to your artist process, um, and especially the work that we have on view at the Hunter. I mean, I think the number one question we get is about process, and mm -hmm. you did talk about you know, camera obscura. Um, it's kind of funny to think that something that has been around for so long feels almost um, magical to um, people today who are more accustomed to being able to take a photo with, like with their phone. Yeah. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more, um, you know, about the specifics of your camera obscura process? Um, things no, no, related no, to, happy to lenses and the size of the pinhole and, and all of that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, as I hopefully narrate it um, enough, uh, my the, the first pictures that I made with the uh, camera here were just basically a hole uh, about the size of a dime. I mean, that's enough to give you a rough image of what's going on outside. It's not real sharp. And now, of course, I have extremely sharp lenses. You know, I've, I've grown up a little bit. But, but I have to tell you that when I thought about making camera, when I thought about using camera obscura demonstrations for my students in the late 80s, it was a way for me to try to be a cool teacher. You know, okay, let's show some of these smart people, you know, some magic or something. So the first time I did it, I had prepared the night before, I had a room blackened out and I had a hole ready with a piece of tape. I had uh, all my students looking at a blank wall and, and I talked a little bit about the principles of optics and camera obscura. Then I took the tape off and Huntington Avenue was upside down on the wall with cars going in color. And these were, were very hip, sarcastic, uh, you know, kids who are like, no, they're not, they're not moved by much. But to the student, everyone was going, no way, this is amazing. They were sort of drawn in the magic of this, this early optical thing in a way that really convinced me that this process has that con way of convincing people that there's still some magic left in the world. And it's not a, it's not a, a video that I'm showing them, it's reality. Uh, it helped me a lot to understand how, how to best communicate with my students. And uh, th this was really fun. And I became a very cool teacher then. What's the significance of color in your works? Or is there um, challenges um, related to black and white works versus uh, works in color? Yeah, when I, with film, color, color film, long exposure is a very difficult to control because there's a lot of shifts in the color itself um, and it's just hard to control. But in 19, uh, maybe 2007, I made a picture in the Philadelphia Art Museum. Uh, I took a black and white image and a color image, uh, a color negative. And I developed, I mean, I had the color uh, image printed and it just blew me away how beautiful and strange the color was. So, it, you know, it's almost like I, I thought that I, I was uh, married to black and white, but then I thought maybe I'll start cheating a little bit. And, uh, and color became, you know, a kind of a, an amazing new discovery for me, like late in life. Um, well, that brings us to a great question um, we had from somebody who's tuning in right now. They want to know if you always had um, this curiosity and creativity about you, even as a child. I, I, I don't know about a child, but I've, I've, I've always been interested in surpassing myself. Uh, I think maybe being a child, I mean, I was 13 when I arrived from Cuba to New York City, 
which is overwhelming. But I do remember thinking that I wanted to, to climb, <laughs> climb some ladder uh, because the whole thing was so overwhelming. So I've always wanted to do something different or something that hadn't been done before. Maybe it's the ambition of an immigrant. Uh, maybe that's part of it. But I still have it. I've been working harder than... I'm 73 now, and I've been working harder than ever in the last 10 years. I've got tons of work that I just keep making, and it's really... It's a way of life. It's a way of, of thinking, well, I'm not done yet. And, uh, and part of my mission is to, to create new ideas that will take me to say France. <laughs> Do you think that your works, um, you know, represent an aspect of the self or of your past? Um, or do you kind of consider your works being this more universal familiarity that, you know, it, it's not so much of a personal reflection? Uh, <laughs> there must be me in these things. I'm sure that I'm in there. I just don't want to make it overt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just not interested in in meditating on what I feel. You know, I, I'm mostly interested in uh, how how I see things. So it's through that vision that things become interesting. You know, the same field, if you look at it differently, looks like a new field. So that's, for me, the more important part, vision. Uh, self, I think it's just contained in whatever I do, but it's not my number one priority. I'm kind of boring as a person. I think what I make is less boring. Well, we had another great question, especially about um, your abstract images, um, the uh -huh. works that you are doing with the paint. And um, the question is, will you sell the original painting um, <laughs> to be like a piece of your work um, or at least displaying that painted piece along with the photographic work? Yeah, they're like five million dollars. Are you interested? <laughs> no, I. Uh, it's it's the f photograph of it that interests me. If you look at the the real thing, sometimes they're like four by three inches big, um, and they're not that interesting as objects. It's in my lighting of it, and in the composition of double exposures. That's interesting. No, I I erase these things and paint over them. So nothing is saved. I'm not, I'm not interested in being a painter. I'm interested in being a photographer who's looking at paint. And it's what, what photography reveals about the world is what's really interesting to me. But uh, no, the idea of showing a, a, a canvas, well, it frightens me and also makes me really insecure. And when did the art world start really looking at your work and taking your work seriously? In, when my son was born, uh, Brady, in 1986, I began making pictures of um, children's stuff, uh, children's objects and pictures of Brady when he was little. And uh, MoMA bought a picture of that I took up Brady. Then I started look, uh, making the, the light bulb picture uh, soon after that. And they put it in a big show. And then things you know, started rolling again. But it was, it, you know, I, I like to tell my students that I, I, was, I was 40 when I first sold my first picture. Uh, I've, I've never quit, um, no matter what. It's always been, I've always been driven. Uh, and it's nice to get recognition, but I, I just want to be able to keep going. Uh, that's, that's my biggest neurosis. You know, I don't want to wake up tomorrow and not be able to do this. So in some ways, that's why I'm doing so much of it. 
Uh, you have a, a big fan, and I think a former student of you yours is tuned in uh, this evening, um, Megan Ledbetter, who says that she's very excited to have oh, um, your work Megan. here in the hometown. I love and Megan. So she was asking, um, when you arrange the subject um, up to the edges of the frame, can you expand on how you are playing with scale, and what size do you print the new painted images? Um. First, in this picture, um, with the digital camera that I have, which it's techy stuff, but it's 150 megapixels. So the resolution is super amazing. It, you look at it, it feels like paint. But I'm able to focus you know, four inches on the bottom to about four feet in the back. I can make that equally sharp. So the idea of perfect sharpness throughout this landscape really changes the perception and the consciousness of how a landscape like that uh, is seen. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm on top of some mountain looking at a landscape. Uh, so that's, that's important to me to, to show a, a perspective that feels a little bit weird, but you do feel like you're on top of some hill or something because the, the top part is the same paint, but now it looks, the mountains are a little smaller. Um, it's recreating a kind of a landscape, but in miniature. Well, and a lot of people had um, questions related to um, your use of digital technology. Um, so I'm going to try to ask you multiple questions by kind of grouping them together. Sure. Um, one of the ones is like how much of your work is planned versus left to chance, especially your pre-digital works that you were saying could take several hours um like how many of those works are like after those several hours would have been discarded or deemed unsuccessful um but then specifically regarding um you know your move to digital what those frustrated what those frustrations and joys have been mm -hmm. um, and like how the digital technology has either complicated or simplified your photographic process. You know, this, you never see the, the artist garbage bin, you know, <laughs> this, so much of it ends in there. So no, many, many, many times I've made camera obscure pictures where it's an eight hour exposure then I drive to Boston, develop the film, and it's, it's no good. Uh, so yeah, lots of failures, lots and lots of failures. Um, when something succeeds, then it does give you a kind of a boost. Um, with, with the digital technology, which by the way, I'm photographing reality. I'm not like putting unicorns in the sky, you know, that's that bullshit. I'm, I'm not interested in digital technology that fabricates reality. In my work, I photograph reality, things like paint on a surface. It's always, it's always important that uh, those worlds get seen uh, as real. I mean, when I make multiple exposures, you still, I'm put, still putting together two or three solid realities to make a kind of a cubism, but I'm not gonna be adding some bullshit thing just to, for an effect that I really hate that idea, of digital technology being used like that. It's just, it's ugly and it's silly and anyway. Um, so digital technology really helped a lot with the camera obscura works where it used to be eight hours uh, in the past Uh, in this picture, can you see this picture? Is it, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So this is the first one I ever made and that was eight or nine hours, um, which is kind of fun, you know, you go shopping and have dinner or whatever. But with nine hour exposures, if the sky is interesting, if there's clouds and funny lights, that nine hours blanks everything out. You don't get a particular light, mm -hmm. which I think is a problem because now 
Uh, let's see if I can get. Well, I'm gonna, this is a tenth picture, but um, this is a two minute, one minute or two minute exposure with digital mm -hmm. technology, which would have taken six hours to do. Well, you get people, there's a line, they're not that sharp, but there's a line of people there, which enhances the feeling of a moment being explored. It's not eight hours of composite moments, it's a moment of light and an event. And to me, that's very important that the specific uh, thing of light is important. It's what happened when Monet, when he was painting, a, a new technology came about uh, and the impressionists loved it because there was a uh, technology that allowed people to put paint in tubes. Suddenly people like Monet could take his tubes of paint to nature. And if there's a funny light on the edge, they could paint it. And they wanted that, that sense of response to a moment. So digital technology for me has allowed me to, to preserve moments uh, in a way that I couldn't before. So that's, that's one, that's, I mean, that's one uh, way of looking at it. I hope that answers it. Would you say that the camera obscura work, um, you know, influenced the way that you as a photographer are addressing composition um, or the way that you see like the everyday within the world? Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, you know, I, when I, I, we arrived as refugees, <clears throat> in 1962 to New York City, we lived in a basement and there was only one window looking up. And that was my, my view of America. So looking at the world, finding out about America through that window, it's pretty weird. So in some ways being inside the camera obscura is replicating some of the, maybe the alienation, but also craziness that I mean, I've always wanted to, to share uh, my strange ways of looking at the world. And uh, I mean, like this picture here, you know how many billion pictures have been made of Old Faithful? And they're all, I'm sorry, they're all boring. <laughs> uh, maybe an Ansel Adams one is good. But uh, I want it, I wanted to share with the public how my way of getting around the normal is also an interesting way of looking at the world. And are you inspired by the work specifically of, of Van Gogh? Like, does he, um, are his works also influencing your um, like your painting series, for example? Um, I'm influenced by everybody. Um, I mean, I, every day there's five or six new books arrive of paintings in my studio. Uh, but I've been studying him a lot and the way that he, he's like a, one of the great colorists of all time. Uh, there are very few of those. David Hockney is also a great colorist. So I'm influenced by that sense of making uh, the side of a, um, a person blue and, you know, that sense of the, the, the way Forvis, you know, the Matisse and the Brox later um, made the world a little bit more irrational by having color be an element. So, you know, no, Van Gogh is really important to me because he was a, troubled man, um, struggled, but he was, from what I read, happiest when he was working and he worked a lot. And his last, his last uh, place in Auvergne in 
near Paris. Uh, he made, in 70 days, he made 70 paintings. So there's something about that kind of uh, way of attacking the world through art that rings, rings true to me. Well, Abe, I, I think we're about at time. I just, you know, I wanted to thank you so much for, you know, joining us in this virtual setting, for taking the time to speak with us, you know, about your technique and works and, you know, answering all these questions. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to throw in the, like this one last question, because I, sure. I do think that it's great um, sure. to see if you are still working with students um, <clears throat> and what you basically have learned from, from your students. Yeah, no, I, I stopped teaching about 10 years ago, but I do have in my studio, I have an amazing assistant who is from MassArt and Max LaBelle, I mean, he, he makes all this stuff possible. But every semester I have an intern from MassArt and they come in for that one semester and I adore those moments because I love teaching. I was, it, I was made for teaching because I, Basically, I could pick their brains and soak some of what they had. They also reminded me of who I was at that age too. So there's a certain reciprocal feeling of for a young student to discover something that makes them light up. Just the best feeling for a teacher to see. And uh, I've learned everything through through students. I mean, they're their energy, their ways of doing things uh, wrong or right. I, I, I need it to, to be in partnership with them. Uh, so the idea of not uh, hanging around with young people in art will be unthinkable. So they're hugely, hugely important to artists. Well, on that, you know, again, thank you so much. This has been such an enjoyable and engaging evening. Um, again, I also want to thank our generous sponsor for the exhibition, the Benwood Foundation, for their support of Beyond the Frame, and Martha Mackey for her continued support of ArtWise, including this evening's fascinating discussion with artist Abelardo Morel.